I want to tell the story of the worst movie adaptation I've ever seen. A movie adaptation that was so bad, in fact, that if I'm honest with myself, the long-term effect of me seeing it had me question my entire worldview, my entire way of approaching progress, and probably just as much as any piece of culture or work of art that I genuinely did like, this adaptation set me on a path that would lead directly to my own current reactionary worldview. However, strangely enough, when I try to tell the story about the worst adaptation I've ever seen, I find that I'm naturally drawn back to several experiences I had as a child living briefly in the United Kingdom, and that most of the pertinent childhood experiences that I recall from that time are linked directly to revelations I had upon completing the last serious AAA video game I ever played. But now, of course, I've probably not just confused every listener to this video, but also myself, so I guess I have to start over from the beginning, or is it the end? That is, of course, the last video game I ever seriously played, Bioshock Infinite. In the last installment of this video series, I took on Bioshock, one of my all-time favorite video games, and a title that I think will become infamous for being just as good, if not artistically better, than the source material, that source material being Ayn Rand. After this video, many people asked if I had liked or if I would do a review on Bioshock's very infamous sequel, Bioshock Infinite. Now, Bioshock Infinite, the original Bioshock's less groundbreaking but somehow paradoxically more controversial sequel, had been on my list to do a video on but I really had a hard time knowing where to start with it all. To be clear, I did enjoy Bioshock Infinite when I played it. It was certainly what we would call a good video game. It was deeply thematic and technically well done, at least. But nevertheless, what Bioshock Infinite was was a distinct falling short of the promise of the original Bioshock game. It did not work well as art, and for whatever coincidental reason, Bioshock Infinite happened to be the last story-driven game I ever played. Perhaps it was out of some subconscious disappointment, but of course there are always random life and circumstantial changes that account for habits and entertainment. Bioshock Infinite was certainly a significant game in my mind. It made an impact on me. But nevertheless, I considered the review of it to be quite difficult, not the least because Bioshock Infinite had been a magnet for video game criticism, both of the positive and negative variety. It had premiered in early 2013, the golden age of video game journalism. Anyone who had a positive thing to say about it or a negative critique, however mundane or ideological, pretty much had them all written up by 2014. What could I say six years later that would really be any different, that would really add anything to the conversation? Yet the project kept on growing on my mind until finally I went back and played the first few chapters of Bioshock Infinite, and I was surprised to find that the things I liked about it in 2013 I hated, and the things that I hated in 2013 actually seemed more forgivable. Sure enough, the game was a total mess, but it was indicative of a certain cultural moment. It was a game that really only could have been made in 2013, and that was the beginning of some new thoughts on the matter. For background, Bioshock Infinite was a loose sequel of the original Bioshock, itself a parody of Ayn Rand and her philosophy of objectivism. True to form, but not necessarily true to plot continuity, Bioshock Infinite formed a new story, this time focused around a slightly different time period and a slightly different type of right-wing dystopia. Moving from the Art Deco, underwater city of Rapture, to the Art Nouveau, flying city of Columbia, the timeline shifts from 1959 to 1912, and the ideological target shifts from atheist, super-individualistic uber-capitalism to religiously-fueled, collectivistic nationalism. The plot, on its surface, being very straightforward, involved a private investigator named Booker DeWitt, who was tasked with locating and retrieving a specific girl held prisoner in the flying city of Columbia. Playing as Booker, it was incumbent upon the players to explore the weird counterculture of the city of Columbia, a type of takeoff on the America of 1912, except more nationalistic, more xenophobic, and more mindlessly religious. 
Although the plot eventually devolves into the kind of fetch quest with guns and shooting that most modern AAA titles really require to sell, nevertheless the plot did build into a very satisfying twist, a type of semi-paradoxical ending that in true Lynchian fashion seemed to answer all of the key plot questions. And it was a twist that genuinely surprised me, even though it was amply hinted at in the plot, and even though the famous twist in the original Bioshock had me looking for it right from the beginning. And Bioshock Infinite went further. It was more than simply a sleek shooter in an interesting and evocative environment, with a David Mamet-type twist at the end. There was a genuine heart and soul in it. It had interesting and memorable characters, or I should say two characters at least. The first, the player character Booker DeWitt, was quite a compelling, hard-boiled private investigator character. He had an interesting backstory and a gruff personality that made players want to understand more about him. And Booker's character was complemented by more or less his mirror opposite, Elizabeth, the girl in the tower, the MacGuffin that originally sets off the quest, and quite an independent character in her own right, despite the fact that she was an NPC. Elizabeth nevertheless did have a very vibrant personality and a significant role to play in the story. The interaction between Booker and Elizabeth made you care about the characters. And that was unusual, especially for a game of the shooter variety, of which Bioshock was certainly one. So, okay, that's fair enough. The game seems to have everything. It's got a sleek design, good gameplay, an interesting and evocative setting that's original. It has brains and a twist ending and a mystery, and characters you really care about. So how come so many people hated the game? How come I, after initially loving the game, began to slowly think less of it the more I thought of it? How come, as the years keep on going by, my estimation of what Bioshock Infinite was as a work of art continues to go down and down and down, until now it seems almost like a trashy piece of fiction. Answers to this question were abundant, even in the reviews that came out in 2013. As many of the more astute video game journalists pointed out, at least those who didn't get sucked into the hype that was Bioshock Infinite in 2013, while Bioshock Infinite certainly had very good elements in isolation, a good plot, a sleek design, fun gameplay, none of the elements really seemed to come together to make a cohesive whole. The pointed but rather banal political points the game wanted to make didn't seem to really match up with the lush Art Deco feel that the city of Columbia had during most of the game's runtime. The shooter slash scrounging slash fetch quest nature of the Bioshock engine, well suited for survival horror as was the original Bioshock, seemed less well suited in a game that largely took place inside of a populated city, and that involved a very complex plot with many characters in it. Nothing takes you out of a game so much as having a character trying to find a ticket to attend the embassy ball, then to stop and search through a trash can in order to eat a piece of cake out of it and regain a few HP. Yeah, Booker, that's great. I'm sure the smell of trash is really going to help you blend in when you're rubbing elbows with Columbia's top brass. But on top of this, there was yet one more jarring mismatch among Bioshock Infinite's many myriad components. A mismatch that was readily pointed out by most game reviewers who took issue with Bioshock Infinite in 2013. My favorite, of course, being Noah Antweiler of the Spoonie One Project. And this mismatch was the mismatch between the gameplay and the deep personal story that Bioshock Infinite was trying to tell. Insofar as Bioshock Infinite's identity as a game went, it was a first-person shooter, which meant violence had to be a large component of it. More than even a large component of it, violence had to be the primary way you solved problems in the game, or it wasn't going to be a Bioshock game. And, true to form in most sequels, the second one had to be bigger and better, which meant bigger guns, bigger explosions, and, for first-person shooters, bloodier deaths. But thematically, the identity of Bioshock was going in an altogether different direction. The art and the storyboard directors were trying to tell a personal story, and not just any personal story, a personal story about redemption, about change. A story about memory and identity that was really more slow and profound than anything that the game could provide in its ordinary gameplay. 
I mean, you can tell the story of a hardened war criminal slowly being won over by the virtues of a female companion. You can even tell the story in a video game. But it's hard to incorporate this into a playing experience that's built around killing. I can't hear a reflective and contemplative dialogue after I've sent a pack of crows to eat out someone's eyes and set off a shotgun on someone's face. As Noah Antweiler pointed out, it's jarring. One moment you're talking to Elizabeth about a Punch and Judy show, the next moment you're taking a radial saw to someone's face. Basically, two good things don't get better when you put them together, like a gun sword or going to a restaurant ordering lobster thermidor and finding a hamburger on top of it. All of these criticisms are legitimate, and I certainly wouldn't be the first person to point out that Bioshock Infinite would have worked much, much better as a PG-13 adventure movie than it did as a shoot-em-up action game. And for some reason, the more I played Bioshock, the more jarring this dissonance became in my mind. I just couldn't get rid of it. But even though this dissonance between gameplay and story is the real thing wrong with Bioshock Infinite, and is probably the reason why it's neither as good a form of art as the original, nor as memorable a title looking back at it six years later, this problem still isn't what's brought Bioshock Infinite back in my mind again and again and again since 2013. It's not the reason, I think, that if we ever do write a history of video games as an art form, Bioshock Infinite probably will be a sort of turning point, at least for video game criticism. There's a reason why I consider Bioshock Infinite not just to be bad or misconceived, but in some ways outright insulting. And that has everything to do with its politics, and really the specific thing that it was in 2013. In short, it was the hidden dissonances within Bioshock Infinite that nobody was really talking about. As I've mentioned in other videos, something strange happened in American culture in late 2012 and early 2013. There was a turning point that began after Obama's second term. America suddenly became more political. The left, in particular, became less forgiving. Critiques of American mainstream culture, which at one point had only been in universities, began being seen in mainstream culture properly, and there was a general ramping up of tensions. And I know people like blaming this on social media, but social media had been around for quite some time. It was more or less a six or seven year old phenomenon. And yet, in 2013, we saw some kind of cultural inflection point. Something changed, and Bioshock Infinite was very much a weather vane of this change. I should say right up front that Bioshock Infinite, a game that had been in development for years, was obviously supposed to have a very heavy-handed political message within it. Certainly this is due, in no small part, to creator Ken Levine's own personal political biases, which are fairly obvious in the other games. Describing an era in America, the early 20th century, that oftentimes figures very prominently in America's own boogeyman stories of past racism, I was expecting some amount of hand-wringing over discrimination and bias and all the bad things the white man did in times past. But still, when I finally got my hands on Bioshock Infinite and began playing it, I was kind of caught off by the game's ham-fisted and thoroughly overwrought description of early 20th century American racism. It's one thing to talk about the prohibitions and illegalization of interracial marriage. It's another thing to show them getting stoned to death at a public carnival. Shirley Jackson style. In Bioshock Infinite's Columbia, the former Union Army, fresh from its massacres of Indians, has now taken up to worshipping, of all people, John Wilkes Booth. The game goes to great lengths to show that everyone in Columbia is totally biased against anyone who isn't a Christian, but the Columbians themselves seem to adhere to some weird non-Christian religion where they worship the secular founding fathers. And if this bizarre perspective on early 20th century religion wasn't weird enough, what would a good old retcon of labor relations look like without an insinuation that fundamentalist Christians and the secular progressive factory owners who wanted to make a buck off of cheap labor were always secretly in league with each other? In short, this is less like an exaggeration of a particular philosophy, as was seen in the original Bioshock, and more like a merger of all things that progressives hated about early 20th century America, whether they were at war with each other during that age or not. 
I think it's undoubtable that Bioshock Infinite got more progressive as the game went on in development. The creator realized that he had to have a deeper social commentary within a game that took place in 1912. You could even see this in some of the character designs, most prominently Daisy Fitzroy, a revolutionary character who, in an early script of the game, was obviously meant to be some type of Scotch-Irish laborer. In the final cut of the game, she's African-American. But nevertheless, despite all the ham-fisted and overwrought progressive pieties that existed inside Bioshock Infinite, for some people, for some video game journalists, it didn't seem to be enough. After the initial set of positive reviews circulated, many progressive video game outlets began foisting a criticism on Bioshock Infinite, claiming that later levels depicting the revolutionary Vox Populi as being violent created a false equivalency between racists and those who resisted racists. Of course, defenders of Bioshock Infinite, like myself at the time, were perfectly ready to um actually this objection with facts and logic from history itself. After all, trade unionists were very violent, and the early 20th century was characterized by horrific violence inspired by labor and left-wing forces. If we're going to be hampisted towards the right, it's fair enough to be hampisted towards the left, isn't it? Of course, this was 2013. No one really realized yet that none of this really mattered. The game could have been a wall-to-wall -wall progressive political cartoon, and many of these journalists would have complained that the game forced you to occupy a character that must have at one point been racist. But as time went on, I began seeing what many progressive journalists might have been talking about. The portion of Bioshock where, briefly, the revolutionary Daisy Fitzroy was the villain seemed to be somewhat dissonant with the rest of the theme, the rest of the political identity of Bioshock Infinite. In its heart of hearts, Bioshock was a very hateful game. At least politically speaking, it really only had one thing to say about the early 20th century in America, and that was it was altogether horrid. I mean, this was one of the foundational periods in American history, and yet it's portrayed as a 1984 society. The only redeeming thing about it is its Art Deco architecture. And in that sense, maybe it would make more sense for Bioshock to be a wall-to-wall -wall progressive political cartoon that happened to take place in the early 20th century. Less nuanced, to be sure, but certainly communicating a little more of what the director actually felt about that period. That more and more seemed to be what Bioshock Infinite really wanted to be. Except, of course, for one fly in the ointment. One problematic character, one problematic plot point that didn't seem to really fit with the narrative. And no, that character isn't Daisy Fitzroy and her sudden bout of political violence at the end of the video game. That character is the game's pseudo-protagonist, Elizabeth. Because just as much as Bioshock Infinite devoutly believes that Columbia, and by extension America of the early 20th century, was bad, bad, bad with very few redeeming features, it also devoutly believes that Elizabeth is angelic, a person of virtue who only wants to do good and carries compassion and grace with her wherever she goes. I mean, she's the one who bears witness to all the evil going on around her and recognizes it for what it is. She, in essence, is the true judge of Columbia, even though Columbia produced her. Now, these type of perfect, angelic female characters are very common in progressive-oriented fiction and culture. In fact, they even have a very infamous internet name. Yes, dear viewers, I'm talking about the infamous Mary Sue. Now, if this was before 2017, I'd probably have to explain what a Mary Sue was. But thanks to hundreds upon hundreds of Star Wars The Last Jedi reviews, this has more or less become lingua franca in the internet community. In short, a Mary Sue is a self-insert perfect character that serves as a foil to everyone else. She has no flaws. She only wants to do the right thing. And everyone loves her. Even the villains love her. And if that wasn't enough, usually the Mary Sue is equipped with some godlike power, which is certainly true in the case of Elizabeth, albeit her godlike powers have a very clever in game explanation. The Mary Sue can do no wrong. She recognizes all evil, and she is the ultimate center of the entire world. And she also tends to be incredibly boring. And for a moment, it might seem that the Mary Sue archetype fits Elizabeth very well, perhaps a bit too well. 
Maybe Bioshock's true form was just a piece of progressive propaganda, with a Mary Sue character cleverly inserted in the middle, likable enough to keep the audiences unaware while the political message was being weaved deftly around them. But even this didn't completely fit, because unlike most Mary Sues, Elizabeth wasn't boring. She was, in contrast, fascinating, the most fascinating thing about Columbia in many ways, and she wasn't even purely speaking, a Mary Sue. She had some flaws. She was petty and petulant at times, somewhat immature, naive in her own beliefs about the world. She's even shown at one point doing something quite morally questionable, and that didn't fit the archetype. Her character was almost familiar, although nothing about her made any sense. Here she was, being raised in a totally deplorable society. Yet all the mannerisms it had taught her made her more charming, more feminine, more angelic, and paradoxically enough, more real. Because Elizabeth was not a child of the dystopia of Columbia. She was, archetypically at least, a child of the early 20th century West. And her presence in the story of Bioshock Infinite gave the lie to everything it was trying to present about that time period. Maybe America was an irredeemably evil place, with only a thin veneer of civilization in 1912. Certainly, we've heard that story many times, if not from video game producers in 2019, from literary figures in the 1920s. Still, if this was the case, if this dystopian viciousness was really the reality, that vicious reality had somehow found the key to something that was far more angelic and far more godly than most of the female icons that graced our own age. Did we exchange our own vision of civilization and compassion and high culture in order to expunge racism and hate from our society? Perhaps that's the trade-off we made, and if it's indeed a trade-off we did make, it was, if justified, a tragic one. But that tragic exchange is one thing that is far too scary for a game with the politics of Bioshock Infinite to ever really take on with full force. And so we're left with something that's bizarre, less a satire of the world and the ideology it wants to describe, and more a farce, more a joke about our own age than any kind of commentary about a time that passed more than a century ago. And so now, whenever I look back upon this game Bioshock Infinite, I don't see a visionary video game, I don't see even a failed sequel. I see instead an ugly mask that's attempting to obscure something far more powerful and far more magical than anything the game conceived of in its original design. And I wanted to take a moment to try to find that, to try to isolate it, and understand what had really been lost. In our present age, a discussion of femininity is always fraught, especially if you happen to run a YouTube channel. One moment a YouTuber is praising the concept of femininity, the next moment he's posting nudes on Twitter, or worse yet, transitioning into a female himself. So how to approach genuine curiosity about a female archetype? The most I could say about Elizabeth from Bioshock Infinite was that she seemed familiar. This was an archetype I had read many stories about, not the least of which were a set of books that kicked off my own fascination with literature as a fairly young child living briefly in the United Kingdom in the early 90s. Of course, childhood memories are another very difficult thing. It's always hard to detach your genuine experiences from the sentimentality you associate with them. But as a child, one of my most formative experiences was when I got to live briefly in the United Kingdom and attend school there for half a year. As a young child, I think this experience did give me quite a broad view, if of nothing else, history. But more than any specific place or trip I took or the many different cultural experiences I had, if I'm being honest, one of the most formative things of that entire time were the books I encountered. My parents in particular, having a bit of a literary bent themselves, took the opportunity to introduce us specifically to British literature, English literature, and among the many books that we were given and read, 
I remember three in particular, the first of course being The Hobbit, of which I will probably dedicate another entire video to, the other two being much more unusual selections for a young boy, Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland and Francis Burnett's The Secret Garden. I remember absolutely adoring all three of these books, even though the last two of the selection were rather unusual fare for young boys. They both featured female protagonists which weren't known for fighting or conquering dragons, and although their main characters were rather subdued and almost passive, there was something deeply admirable about them. And this was strange, especially in the case of Frances Burnett's character, who unlike Lewis Carroll's Alice, didn't have fantastic creatures to contend with or a dreamlike maze to struggle and find her way through. Nevertheless, Mary's thoroughly Edwardian journey and character was fascinating. And later, in my imagination, she was joined by another Edwardian character, the Canadian Anne Shirley from Lucy Maud Montgomery's Anne of Green Gables, who, like Mary, seemed to have a very Edwardian set of virtues and a very Edwardian mystery about her. This was the same heroic charm that seemed to occupy the character of Elizabeth from the video game Bioshock, but in its original form, described from authors who actually came from the early 20th century, it seemed much, much more magical and much more honest. There seemed to be, and still seems when I return to them, something deeply mysterious in these stories and characters. As surprising as it was that a boy of a young age like myself would find something magical in a 90-year-old book about an Edwardian girl, I oftentimes wonder whether children or adults of our own age might even understand the deep mystery or magic of these books. It seems something less from a hundred years ago and something altogether of a different age. The values seem totally inverted. Oddly enough, the Yorkshire of Mary Lennox seems further away from our own world than the Wonderland that Alice Little explored in Lewis Carroll's masterpiece. I've been told by others that, very unsurprisingly, these books are growing less and less popular among today's children. No doubt part of this is that adults aren't sharing these books with children, and no doubt the excuse is that people need to get away from the old forms. We have a certain contempt from the West of the 20th and 19th century, and we don't want to expose children to it, at least not in a politically unapproved fashion. In many ways, the reasons for not revisiting the early 20th century children's classics like A Secret Garden or Anne of Green Gables match up very symmetrically for the reason to pour scorn on the imaginary cartoon early 20th century America depicted in Bioshock Infinite. After all, those were the bad old days of racism and imperialism. Sure, they looked nice. Sure, people dressed with mystery and class, and that can be seductive. But that outward beauty covers up a deep spiritual malformation. After all, the only reason why England was beautiful in the Edwardian age was because of the misery it subjected people to in the empire. It was the destitution of the Hindu and the Chinese that bought high civilization for the American and British empires. Or at least so we are to believe if you look at art like Bioshock Infinite and really any contemporary cultural criticism from the universities. Sure, they look beautiful and mysterious, but just like the empires they implicitly represent, Scratch and Elizabeth, Scratch and Anne Shirley, Scratch a Mary Lennox, and sure enough, you'll find the same ugly imperialism, the same ugly racism standing behind them. That is the essence that fuels their mystery, and the civilization that sheltered that mystery. And for this reason, these figures are, in the contemporary view, nothing more than frauds. But is that true? Even in the case of Elizabeth, a character taken straight out of 21st century political propaganda meant to make the early 20th century look like a hellish, hypocritical, and bigoted place, she doesn't seem to carry any of that hatred with her. In fact, her very presence in the story seems to subvert the author's own characterization of the era. And to vary the example, while many contemporary feminists would like to claim Montgomery's Anne Shirley as a type of proto-feminist, the Anne of Green Gables series seems to subvert this characterization, as Anne always puts family first, even before her own career. 
This was from an era where small virtues trumped political considerations. I think it comes as no particular surprise that Anne Shirley's character is particularly popular among Japanese women. She, after all, is the virtuous student. Nevertheless, I think the strangest case has to be found in Burnett's Secret Garden, which, far from being imperialistic, seems to contain, dare I say, a singularly reactionary message. For those not familiar with the plot, The Secret Garden tells the story of a child, Mary Lennox, who is the daughter of what would be the Edwardian version of the jet-setting elites, a wealthy set of British mandarins working in the imperial structure of occupied India. Her parents, being more interested in politics and socializing, pay really no attention to their daughter, who is raised mainly by their Indian staff cater to to such extent that the girl almost has no idea how to care for herself out of the care of her nanny. Really though, when I read this part of the book again, I kind of chuckled to myself. It looks like pretentious global elites are not a new thing. You can almost imagine Mary's parents being guardian readers. Nevertheless, a horrific tragedy strikes when a cholera outbreak occurs, leaving Mary orphaned. Subsequently, she's sent back to England to live in Yorkshire with her very stern uncle, who has a cold and mysterious mansion set upon equally cold and mysterious moors. Over the initial part of the story, we see Mary going from being a sickly child who can't care for herself to being somebody who's forced by the British, Scotch, and Irish staff, nonetheless, to play outside and learn how to take care of herself. Moreover, Mary's rejuvenation is accompanied by an increasing fascination with the land itself, which, while much less exotic than the India where she was born, is nonetheless hers. It's something that she can care for and look after. When her uncle grants her a request, she asks only for a piece of earth that she can take care of. Part of this process of Mary's rediscovery of herself is coming to respect the land and to learn how to cultivate it. The rest of Mary's story, however, is focused around two other mysteries. The first being a mysterious walled and unkempt garden where all of the staff are forbidden to tread. The second one being a mysterious sick boy locked away in the lower parts of the mansion, who Mary later discovers is her cousin, the never-mentioned son of her cold and distant uncle. And as the plot goes on, these mysteries come together. The walled garden, it turns out, was the garden of Mary's aunt, the deceased wife of her uncle, who loved it more than anything when she was alive. After his sickly son was born and his wife passed away, Mary's uncle locked the garden and forbade anyone from entering it, lest he recall the painful memory of her death. As Mary and her cousin Colin's friendship grow, they begin to restore the garden, and then implicitly Colin's failing health unbeknownst, of course, to her uncle. When it's finally revealed at the end that Mary has not only restored the garden, where of course she was forbidden to enter, but has also revived the health of her sickly cousin, her uncle's cold demeanor melts away, and he's reminded of the generous man he once was when witnessing the beauty of the restored secret garden. It's a very simple story and quite a beautiful one, but in everything going back to it, far from being a tale of imperialism, the lesson it teaches is quite the opposite. While Mary lives in India, as the princess of India's implicit ruling class, she is in essence being raised a Brahmin, a high-class aristocrat who is somehow permanently separated not only from the people she rules over, but also from the land that she occupies. She has no connection to India. She has no connection to the Hindus, even the Hindus who she relies on for everything. And in such a state, her health fades away. She becomes a shadow. She has no identity. But when Mary returns to Yorkshire, she re-embraces who she is. She's forced outside into a much bleaker environment than the subcontinent. Here, she's faced not only with herself, but a land that she can actually own and cultivate. Although she is of upper class, and necessarily the ward of the house's master, she's nonetheless not entirely separated from those who serve her. She knows them. They look after and correct her. 
And there is something strong in that. More direct yet is the symbolism of the secret garden, which mirrors directly Mary's uncle's relationship with his own family, with his own land. The garden represents everything that the British aristocrat should be. It represents everything of what differentiates an aristocrat from a Brahmin. The Brahmin is aloof. He is of a different kind than the people he rules over. He is spiritually not of the land, and he is set apart because he does not dig the earth. He is higher because he is detached. But the aristocrat rules because he is of the same blood and land as the people who he rules over. Of course, he has a higher rank, and rank must be respected for practical purposes. But, as is always said, noblesse oblige. He must remember his connection to those who serve under him. And in that, the garden is the ultimate symbol. In the garden, the aristocrat tills the earth. In the garden, he replicates the very same stewardship of the land that is also carried out by the common folk who live and work on the lands that he possesses. And just as he cares for his own land in his garden, he also cares for his people, starting with his own family. And that symbolic light, I'm not so sure I've ever heard a more succinct takedown of imperialism, at least from a reactionary point of view. And I think we see something similar when we go to Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, albeit this book is much less political. It confronts much less of what it meant to be English in the Victorian age. Nevertheless, I do think you see the same story emerge, at least if you look at our own age's attempts to characterize what Alice in Wonderland really meant. Of course, unlike The Secret Garden, I don't think I need to give a synopsis of Alice in Wonderland or its equally charming sequel, Through the Looking Glass. Everyone knows the story. Girl named Alice falls down a rabbit hole and enters a dreamland called Wonderland, where everything is topsy-turvy, up is down, and she comes across a number of truly fantastic characters with truly illogical takes on the world. However, oftentimes what's left out of this description is the really essential role that Alice's own personality plays to the fun. Of course, there are any number of characters in Wonderland that do things in strange and illogical ways, although there is a weird method to their madness that Lewis Carroll has a lot of fun with. At the end of the day, though, the only reason why it is so much fun is because of Alice. She is the supreme rationalist. She is the true daughter of the Victorian age, always holding to common sense and sensibility, as she was no doubt taught by her Oxford Don parents. Without the sort of Victorian turbo rationality, without the thoroughly English common sense, nothing would be nearly as delightful, regardless of how insane the other characters were. Lewis Carroll, himself being an academic who worked at Oxford, originally wrote the stories to entertain his chancellor's three daughters the Little Sisters, the most famous among them, of course, being named Alice. And it was likely from observation of these girls that Lewis Carroll incorporated the extreme common sense and sensibility of Alice in Alice in Wonderland. Much of the purpose for writing Alice in Wonderland was Lewis Carroll's own fascination with how common sense and sensibility could be exploded when one took rule-based systems to the extreme, a common fascination among mathematicians. And in this lies the true charm and originality of Alice in Wonderland, and I'm certainly not the first to point this out. However, I've noticed that in popular culture at least, the story of the true meaning behind Alice in Wonderland has taken quite a bit of a darker turn. Probably the most common explanation of Alice in Wonderland, at least post-1960s, was that it was a drug-fueled trip on the part of a pedophile who secretly lusted after his neighbor's little girl. Of course, uh, Jefferson Airplane songs aside, there's no evidence to support that Lewis Carroll thought up Wonderland as part of some kind of drug-fueled trip. There's also absolutely no evidence to suggest any untoward intentions on the part of Lewis Carroll towards the Little Sisters. That is pure 20th century myth as far as we know. But even after these direct myths have been dispelled, there still is this unending fascination with trying to recast Alice in Wonderland to capture its true darkness, which of course was not present in the original version of Alice in Wonderland. 
Some of these attempts have been truly inspired, such as Jen Schenkmeyer's 1988 dark fantasy Alice. I even thought some of the aesthetics around America McGee's Alice were kind of interesting, at least a nice takeoff on Tennille's original Victorian illustrations. Still, despite the fact that the dark Alice in Wonderland has been done to death again and again since the 1960s, apparently it doesn't stop directors from keeping on trying it. Which brings me, finally, to the worst adaptation I've ever seen. Tim Burton's 2010 Alice in Wonderland. Now, perhaps I should have been more prepared from the catastrophe that was 2010's Alice in Wonderland. After all, the decline of Tim Burton's career was a well-documented fact by that time. Still, at the time, I saw very few movies. And 1989's Batman and Beetlejuice still were among some of my favorite films, so it didn't seem impossible that Tim Burton wouldn't have an original take on one of the greatest books of all time. I mean, he didn't do that bad of a job on Sweeney Todd, despite having to have Helen Bohem Carter and Johnny Depp cast in musical roles that they were really unsuited for. Nevertheless, when I walked into the theater in 2010, I was expecting some kind of adaptation or tribute to the original material. What I was not expecting was an all-out assault on every element of Alice in Wonderland that made the original charming, insightful, beautiful, or even not insulting to my intelligence. Far from even attempting to locate Alice in Wonderland in a reasonably accurate time and place, Tim Burton starts by translocating Alice Little from the Victorian age to some age that seems to resemble more the Regency of the early 19th century. I don't know, the costumes never really seem to be correct. At any rate, no longer a child, but a young woman, no longer the middle-class daughter of an Oxford don, but instead the unwed daughter of some rich English aristocrat, Alice is on the verge of gasp, unarranged marriage to some Prince Valium from Spaceballs. When, wouldn't you know it, she finds a white rabbit and chases after him, only to get sucked back down to Wonderland. Or is it Wonderland? Everyone's calling it Underland. I guess that's suitable, because there's certainly nothing wonderful or awe-inspiring about any of this. Instead of a large cast of whimsical, yet well-drawn, insane characters, for which Alice has to make sense of and try to treat rationally, this new Alice is confronted by an enormous war between good and evil, where everyone, at least on the good side, is anticipating the coming of a, wait for it, a chosen one who will, of course, slay the dragon and restore peace and justice to the galaxy. I mean, Wonderland. I mean, Underland. I mean, who cares? It sounds like I'm just reciting cliches from the last 30 years of film, because the film is one wall-to-wall -wall cliche. Of course, Alice is the chosen one. Of course, she slays the dragon and liberates the realm. Of course, she triumphs by believing herself, and everyone celebrates her as being their savior, just after the Mad Hatter does a breakdance that I am still nine years later trying to bleach out of my brain. There isn't a single thing in the entire two-hour running time of the film that wasn't entirely predictable, that wasn't a cliché we'd seen a hundred times over. But to add insult to injury, every one of those clichés was being expressed within the body, within the character of another piece of fiction that was still, even 130 years after its publication, truly original. In the words of the late Roger Ebert, I hated, hated, hated this movie. I hated every audience-insulting second of it. But of course, this has all been said. The 2010 Alice in Wonderland was universally panned, breakdancing Mad Hatter included. So why am I still talking about it now? Well, it's because I think it failed in an interesting way. Walking out of the movie, I couldn't help but feel like I was being sold an inferior product. 
I think we can see this starting with the character of Alice herself. 2010's Alice Little is truly the archetype of the Mary Sue to a T. She has no real internal conflict or motivation other than wanting to do the right thing. Everyone in the world is just waiting for her to save them. And the only thing that passes for a character flaw for her to overcome is, stop me if you haven't heard this one before, she doesn't believe in herself enough. All this comes together to form a truly boring Alice. Now, don't get me wrong, the original Alice in Wonderland isn't some huge hero arc. It's not a story of self-development, the way that something like Anne of Green Gables or The Secret Garden was. Alice more or less ends the story as the same person as when she started it. It is a dream, after all. In most of the story, Alice is less a character and more a rationalistic foil to the insanity that's going on around her. But still, in Lewis Carroll's original Alice, I think you see the true charm of Victorian womanhood, the true common sense and sensibility that characterize the archetype. And even without a truly deep plot, it still is mysterious and beautiful. It still is fertile ground for a truly original adventure. The same thing could not be said for the character that inhabits Tim Burton's 2010 CGI monstrosity. But what was truly insulting about the 2010 Alice in Wonderland was that it, a schlocky, paint-by-numbers, forgettable, cliché action movie, deigned to present itself as the revolutionary, as the medium that was throwing off the shackles of conformity that was presumably placed upon it by the Victorian original. Insofar as this movie had any political message, all of the movie's political message was directed towards casting off the shackles of conformity that presumably occupied every element of imperial British society. For a moment on walking out of the theater, I remember laughing to myself, why are we supposed to hate the Victorians? Because of their cultural conformity and lack of imagination? Well, none of that in the 21st century. But oh no, of course, we're actually supposed to hate the Victorians or the Edwardians because of imperialism. Perhaps they had a less cliched take on literature. But just think, all of that beauty and originality was all fake. It was all a cover to justify imperialism, to justify the misery of the Hindu and the Chinese. But, almost as if to mock this alternative theory, Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland seems to have an answer even for this. After the completion of her adventures in Wonderland, Tim Burton's Alice, after learning that she needs to believe in herself, rejects the oppressive Victorian or 19th century or whatever time period it is, society's expectation of her and decides never to marry, never to have a family, to raise the middle finger to all of the societal expectations, just as we expected she would at the beginning of the movie. And instead, Tim Burton's Alice would become her own woman, strike out her own path, find her own way by going abroad and recommencing British imperialism in China. Yes, that's right. In a moment of irony that I can't believe wasn't intentional, after snubbing her nose at all of the conventionality of her home country, Tim Burton's Alice Little goes off and decides to establish trade with China, which for those of us who know how the British Empire actually did start trade with China, involved kicking off one of the sleaziest wars in the Empire's history, where the British Navy was literally put to the ends of opening up the ports of China for the infusion of opium, just so European traders could get a better price on silk in the open market. But no, 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 sleazy imperialism is fine, as long as we learn that we just need to believe in ourselves and snub the societal conventions of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, right? Well, perhaps. It seems at the end of it that there is an implicit message communicated in all of these Victorian and Edwardian heroines. There is a common energy that flows from Alice Little to Mary Lennox to Anne Shirley and even on to Elizabeth from the video game Bioshock Infinite. 
And that message was, that message is, that despite the ugliness and the evils that necessarily accompanied the great Western empires of the 18th and 19th centuries, despite the many evils and wars caused in their name, there was a core goodness to the West of that age. There was a heart and a hearth that was untouched, that was virtuous. There was a brilliance and vivacity that existed behind it all, that existed in each of these nations' essence, in each of their identities. You could see this core energy and goodness of the West. You could see this core essence of Britain and Canada and America in many sundry and small places, in the dreaming spires of Lewis Carroll's Oxford, in the small virtuous lives of settlers on Prince Edward Island, in the noblesse oblige of landowners in Yorkshire, and most importantly and most prominently, in the virtue, sensibility, and grace of the women who lived and brought up families in that era. And these fictional female characters in literature are a testament to that, a reason to not forget what once was. But of course, I know progressives will disagree with this, no doubt. After all, the Victorian age is over, the Edwardian age drew to a close, and there are very few people in our society today that want to defend its virtues, at least among the intellectual elite. Certainly there was a reason for this, right? Things just don't die on their own accord. I'm quite certain that if a progressive critic were here, he'd say something like this. Well, certainly you have an idealized version of what Victorian and Edwardian society was, but these are just fantasies. After all, people got tired of the norms of virtue, and they felt oppressed by them. There was a reason we moved on. We wanted to become liberated. We wanted to become our own people. And of course, this message is very much the same message that existed at the end of Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland, and even implicitly existed in Bioshock Infinite. And I can't directly contest this. There is, of course, no greater testament against an icon than the fact that the people who once revered it then cooperated in tearing it down. And will the destruction of this idealistic heart and hearth that was contained inside the image of Edwardian femininity might be seen as the destruction of an oppressor, I think there are more compelling explanations. And lest I bring up yet another fictional example, I would ask those who doubt this just to examine the life of Alice Little. No, not the fictional character that occupied Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass, but the real little girl that he wrote the stories for. She was a person who grew up in the Victorian age and spent most of her adult life in Edwardian England. Who was this real Alice Little? Well, Alice Little was more or less your run-of-the-mill upper-class English girl. She wasn't impressed into an arranged marriage. By most accounts, she lived a happy life, married a man for love, and had many children. She was even known as a renowned hostess in her circle. But was there no tragedy in the life of Alice Little? Was she not secretly oppressed by her society and times? Well, I suppose we'll never know the answer to the latter question. But as for tragedy, I think that can be quite definitively answered. Because between the years of 1915 and 1918, all but one of her children were gunned down in the trenches of World War I. And in this tragic reality, I think we have a much more compelling story as to the end of this feminine innocence. It wasn't torn down because it was oppressive. It wasn't forgotten because it was a lie. People didn't leave it behind because they found bigger and better things globetrotting off to China and India. The mysterious and beautiful innocence of the West was violently cut out of it. It was destroyed intentionally when the fratricidal ambitions of the globalist empire it had accumulated finally turned around and came to collect its dues. There are loved ones in the glory whose dear
forms you often miss when you close your earthly story will you join them in their bliss will the circle be unbroken by and by by and by is a better sky. 